through as well. All right. Thank you again for your patience and welcome to our March event honoring the life and legacy of Judy Human, celebrating Women's History Month and sharing some personal stories of amazing women with disabilities. This is also the 50th anniversary of the Rehab Act of 1973. And it's certainly fitting uh, that we are also honoring both Judy and her work and her life in Women's History Month. We all miss her, but she has been a wonderful leader in our cause. The DC Metro chapter of Disability Inn is uh, a business organization that focuses on getting employers together to discuss, to dialogue, to learn from each other on how to include more people with disabilities in the workforce. And as I said, Judy Human, the mother of the disability cause, rights movement, I am gonna hope to see if we can play this. So bear with me. Oh. What I will do is I will send you the link to your email so you can hear this is the PBS News Hour. But uh, we miss you, Judy, and thank you for everything you've done for this movement. So Women's History Month started out in 1981, which is not too long ago. Uh, in 82, President Reagan proclaimed Women's History Week, and then the National Women's History Project designated the month as Women's History Month. Between 1988 and 1994, Congress passed additional resolutions requesting and authorizing the, pre the president to proclaim March of each year as Women's History Month. And that's what we're celebrating. And thank you for joining us. Also with us today is my dear friend and colleague, Lori Golden, who's the Ability Strategy Leader for EY. Uh, she is going to join us in this conversation. Lori, do you wanna just introduce yourself real quickly? And glad to have you here. I'm so sorry, I had put myself on mute. Lots of, <laughs> lots of mistakes here. This is Lori Golden. Um, happy to be with all of you, Catherine. Uh, thank you for, for adding me in. Um, I am a white woman, short blonde hair, uh, currently wearing glasses and delighted to be with some of my favorite women today um, and all the rest of you on the phone. On to the next person. Okay. Um, Thank you. So let's meet our panelists. We have Vanessa Grace Bliss, who is an intern at Broad Futures, Rachel Grossman, who's a young professional at EY, and Susan Missouri. Well, I can't say enough things wonderful about Susan. Um, we've been colleagues for a long time. She's at AT&T. So I'd like to start with you, Vanessa, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about yourself. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. I, my name is Vanessa Bliss, and I am currently an intern with Broad Futures, which is a program that gives internships to young adults with learning disabilities and is inspiring inclusion in the workforce and expanding inclusion in the workforce. And um, so you're able to get an internship in the D.C. area as well as get mentorship from, uh, for your um, disabilities and for any support needs that you might have. So I love being able to have that. That's one of pro probably one of my favorite parts of the program. And um, right now I'm a marketing and communication intern, intern for Girl Scouts Nation's Capital. And I also recently graduated from college um, with my Bachelor's of Arts from McDaniel College. Congratulations. Yep, We're thank you. Glad to have you. Rachel, welcome back to the Disability in DC Metro Sideshow. We're glad to have you. Thanks for the warm welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Grossman. I am a white woman with medium length brown hair and brown eyes. I'm currently wearing a gray pullover with the EY logo on my left side. Um, sorry for my background, if it is a little uh, busy, I have a world map behind me as my background. Um, additionally, I've been at, e I'm a manager at EY in our government public, private, or government public sector. I've been at EY for five years, 
and a part of our accessibility professional network as a local co-leader. I was diagnosed in 2002 as being dyslexic with general learning disabilities. So if you see me reading off of some notes, that is there to help me and better assist me as I go through my day in these events. Welcome, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Mass Rui, and I work at AT&T in the area of global public policy. I have been with the company almost 30 years now, um, doing a variety of different jobs, that, but usually related to disability or aging in place. Everything from marketing to regulatory to compliance. Thank you for having me today. Susan, it's always a pleasure. So we're going to start out with some questions, and I hope we'll have some questions from the audience as well. Um, and I'll be monitoring if I can. If I don't see you right away, I'll come back to you. Um, but I'd really also engage for you all to talk to each other. So on this slide, we have a quote from Dr. Seuss. It says, sometimes you never know the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. So Susan, if we could begin with you, what was one of your singular moments that enabled you to take that first step into your career? Anything that reminds you of where you were at that time 30 years ago? Well, it was probably not a singular moment, um, but it was a singular relationship. Uh, when I was in college, I met probably for the first time someone with a serious disability and as a blind person, a person who had been raised outside of special ed, um, it was a new thing. And it was a person who, who was an incredible advocate and being able to see someone who was empowered and basically said to me, you know, it's going to be tough. Let's be realistic, but go for what makes you happy and with your strengths. And I think that that, I, you know, haven't had a single job. I've had many, um, but Dr. Cindy Cole was a great influence for me. And I think the memories back to her really getting me to feel proud of who I was and who I am now um, really helped me move in my career and overcome many challenges because I wasn't alone. Thank you, Susan. Um, Vanessa, mm -hmm. what about you? You're, you're starting your career. Is there anything that you can recall that you believe will be your next step or your first step or something that's happened to you that you can say, now I know where I'm headed? Sure. Um, well, I think really it was broad features that helped me to realize that. Um, I knew I was interested in doing marketing and communications. Um, that was my minor. My minor was communications in college, but I never really quite done anything with it. So I went to Broad Futures and I told them what my interests were. And then they found me a perfect match for an internship. So I've gotten to do some social media content creation for Girl Scouts and I love it. And I think that it's really well suited to me and what I like in a work environment and also what my passions and interests are. So after this, I really would just be looking for jobs in marketing communications, particularly I love social media. Um, I did do a lot of, I made a lot of TikToks for Girl Scouts and I had so much fun with that. So if I get to do any of that, I, um, I would love to do that for a company. And I think I would really be looking for any kind of a company that's sort of creative and artistic because my major is theater and I, I love the arts and I would just love to continue to hone that creative side that I have. I'm so glad you're at the Girl Scouts. They're a great organization. So Rachel, tell us a little bit about your first step into the career world. Sure can, but first I have to say, Vanessa, if you have any links to Girl Scout cookies after the season, <laughs> you need to let us know. <laughs> I'll see what I can do for sure. <laughs> uh, so one of the first steps for me uh, during college, I actually changed my majors. I was originally in the sciences and I went and changed to business. So I first was very scared 
about being in accounting and what my future held for me. Was I just going to be a bookkeeper? Am I going to do taxes all year? I don't want to do taxes all year. My first internship actually was the key turning point in my career at the very beginning because I was lucky enough to have an internal audit internship and I got to travel. I got to see parts of the country I would never think to go on vacation. I was able to do other work with my hands actually uh, and still use my degree, which, which really helped me face a fear of, I don't have to be what I think I have to be. I can be what I set out to be. And so once I graduated college, I received my first job offer and I was an internal auditor. And then after that, I'm an external auditor. So <laughs> life wonderful. definitely changes. Yes, okay, we're can I ask a question? And, and that's to the two of you. I know when I started my career, they said, you are a blind person, you will become a computer programmer. And I'm wondering, which was not the ideal job for me. Um, and there was a big push in certain directions. Did you find that? Or did you have the opportunity to find your own choices and really get to pick from what your strengths were? This is Rachel. I can kind of touch on this. So I would say before going to college, so in grade school, I grew up in the special education system. I had an individual education plan, IEP, -E -I -E uh, to where I actually kind of got held back where I was in my strong suits because I, was, I had to have certain accommodations for my reading spelling. Um, I really pushed myself and loved sciences, uh, but as I got into college, I got very scared of writing. I didn't want to be writing lab papers all day, and so I tried to go business and tried that out, but I was still able to use science in my work, so I kind of was able to get a good balance of using what I loved versus what I am able to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question. Um, I don't know that I've ever really felt um, limited in the, by what career I would do. I think, my biggest maybe challenge is that I just felt very stuck for a long time. And honestly, I still am because even though I have an idea of what field I want to get into, I don't necessarily know if that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Like I might want to change careers. And um, also, I mean, I think one challenge is um, I've had a lot of people nowadays saying that like, oh, well, you know, if you need to go into a career or if you want to, uh, change courses or whatever you have to go to grad school and for me like um college and the stress of it I mean I enjoyed college for the social connections that I made but I just I don't think I can put myself through that again I don't think I can be writing all these papers and taking all these tests again just for my own mental health <laughs> so just a, a lot of people want to give you input on what they think you should do um but none of that really matters. I think you just have to do what feels the best to you in that moment. Hey, this is Lori. Um, I've got a follow on question. Sorry, I'm a voice of God. I'm not going on camera here. Um, I, I, I agree. It's a fantastic question, Susan. And, you know, it strikes me that the three of you all went to school at different times when we had different ideas uh, around disability. And it, Rachel, you know, I know your story and I know you literally had to battle yourself out of special education to get the opportunities you needed to get the kind of education you needed to get where you then thought you wanted to go. I'm curious, Susan, as to what your experience was in school. Um, Rachel, maybe you can amplify on yours. And Vanessa, what was yours? Well, 
I would say my experience was almost diametrically opposed. Um, I started when they just put out a law called PL 94142, which was the precursor to the education for all. And so we didn't have IEPs, we didn't have accommodations, and I literally dropped out of high school because there was no point in my staying. All the advanced classes were upstairs. I have multiple sclerosis. I couldn't go up and down stairs and I couldn't read the print size that they had um, because my vision was starting to, to go at that point. And I was told that I could stay in a special school, but when I left elementary school, I had already tested out of what they required for graduation. So the expectations were very low. Um, but I think what I have in common um, with the two other women here was I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that I should have low expectations and I didn't accept it, even though I was told by a lot of people I probably should. And I was fortunate to have parents who were like, oh, that's nonsense. I also had, because it was so long ago, the added thing of the gender issues. So um, women didn't do certain jobs and would be prevented from certain jobs. And um, they were, you know, teachers who would swear up and down that, you know, girls were not as good at math or those types of things. So there were a lot of limitations or low expectations that I had to work around to get where I needed to go. But I think like the two of you and like Lori as well, there's a sense of who you are and, um, and maybe not having all the answers, but at least being committed to the quest. This is Rachel. I, I love that, Susan, being committed to the quest. It's so true. Um, as Lori kind of alluded there, I, I really did have to actually work to get out of special ed to be, uh, to be in classes that I wanted to be. Um, due to my dyslexia, I had to have like a teacher's aid um, and a separate room to be able to take my exams in. And because of that, which was very helpful, it, it helped me get to but because I was, I had my strengths in math and sciences, I was not able to actually be in those classrooms because they could not accommodate that for me. So it became a, a greater mission for me in grade school to get out of special education so I could attend those classes, to which uh, in high school, I was able to apply and get accepted to the Chesapeake Bay Governor School, uh, which is a college level courses that you take at a different location uh, with other counties with specializing in math and science. So I felt so proud of myself for being able to do something that not many students got selected to do or would willing to put that effort in to even try. So, um, well, first of all, uh, I just want to say that there's this, I, I don't know if you hear it, there's this kind of humming noise in my apartment all of a sudden. It's kind of loud. I don't really know why it's there. So uh, I don't know if you can hear that, but that might be a little distracting. So, uh, but yeah, so going into my education, uh, my educational background. Well, so from, I, so I was in special ed preschool. Um, I, as like a young child, I didn't have necessarily like, so, I mean, I'm autistic, but I didn't really get that diagnosis until age 18. Um, and even just, I guess for the first nine years of my childhood, like they knew I had some kind of learning disabilities and social challenges and stuff like that, but there just wasn't really like a name for it. But I guess I had enough of something that I was able to at least get an IEP at least be in uh, special ed preschool, but then kindergarten through third grade, I was in like just a public school, very traditional kind of public school. Um, then still, still had an IEP, but 
I just wasn't really able to get all the attention that I needed. It was really helpful for me to just have more one-on-one -on -one individualized smaller classes. So from fourth grade, um, all throughout like, you know, fourth grade through 12th grade, I was in a private school. Um, I was in various, various different private schools actually. And uh, some of them were um, not what I had hoped for, you know, to in an educational experience and same with my parents, like some of them, I wasn't really able to get caught up the way I needed to. But um, sixth through eighth grade, I was in a school for specifically for students with learning disabilities. So that really helped. I would say like the social aspect was not great. Um, like, I, I mean, I, I will say I do have one really wonderful friend that I made there and we're still friends today. But other than that, um, you know, nothing, there weren't really great social connections that came out of that. But academically, um, I was able to get caught up and be to where I needed to be. Like, I actually really struggled in math. Like, um, yeah, at nine years old, I got my nonverbal learning disorder diagnosis, which basically means like you're strong with everything like reading, writing, but anything that's not that, anything very visual, spatial kind of, or numbers or something like that are like a weaker point for me. So, um, and then um, high school, I was in a private, I was in a private Catholic high school and um, I was there just because they had a program specifically for students with learning disabilities where I would just go there once a day during my study hall period and I would just get that one-on-one -on -one support that I needed. And again, I didn't really make that many friends in high school. I mean, all the friends I made were outside of my school, but I was still able to get the help that I needed, which I'm grateful for. But I think that in any kind of educational experience, it's really important to um, to be focusing on the whole person. Like, I mean, you need to succeed academically, but I think that succeeding socially is just as important, especially for me, because I'm, I'm really extroverted. I love talking to people. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, we're going to just move on because we want to talk about advocacy. And I'm wondering, since you were just speaking, Vanessa, if you wouldn't mind, you know, you obviously advocated for yourself, all three of you have. Um, but as an intern, do you feel like you have the tools to advocate for yourself and the knowledge of how to do that? Um, yes, I definitely do. I think that's a really wonderful part of Broad Futures is they really work very hard on making sure that you do have that. Um, we and we're also we're able to really learn about that in really fun ways, too. We do. Um, we have a drama curriculum and me having a theater degree. I love that part. <laughs> and um I also and then we also have our mentorship that really helps us to um navigate self-advocacy as well and so with all those tools that I got I definitely feel more comfortable with advocating for myself than I originally did I mean I would say that it, um sometimes it still is something that makes me nervous um but I am just leaving with more knowledge of that than I had before. And I know that like for my next job, for my next opportunity, like there's things that I can keep with me and take with me into that. So I can advocate for myself. Well, I must say that Broad Futures is a fabulous, fabulous organization and program. And if any of you are not familiar with it, at the end of the slides, we have their website. Um, they are a partner of Disability in DC Metro, and I have been so impressed with what has been done there. Susan, um, can you think of, you obviously had to advocate for yourself since you didn't want to be a programmer, um, but can you think of, some, how did you do that? Um, I actually took a slumming language, which is even, isn't even taught, I don't think anymore, and I did really well, and then around two in the morning, erased my backup file accidentally and decided I didn't really want, I would rather do any job um, than that job. <laughs> I would be happier as a janitor than I would be as a programmer because I would actually see something being accomplished. Mm. And while I'm not probably the best 
person at cleaning things right now, um, it did make me aware that sometimes you can do something and it's not right for you. And that was certainly the case for me. I could have probably survived as a programmer, but I would have been miserable. Sometimes you can love something. I love art. I am terrible at art. Has nothing to do with vision loss. I just never had any talent. So maybe that's not how I could make a living. So it was really finding internally what was my, they call the North Star or what was important. And for me, the actual doing the advocacy, not just for myself, but in a broader sense became my, my uh, mission. Mm -hmm. And so I've had several jobs, but they've all pretty much come back to looking at equity. Sometimes it was racial, sometimes it was gender, sometimes it was disability, and often all three. Um, and so being able to understand where I needed to go helped me to advocate beyond just myself. And there's a great saying by Hillel, which, you know, starts out with, um, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? And so that was one guiding principle. And the next one that goes with that is if I'm only for myself, what am I? And so I kind of broadened it. I think for me, the challenge, because I'm not a natural extrovert like Vanessa, was getting past my own um, personality type to then learn to speak to others and to express myself in a way that they could hear. And it, it's a challenge still today. Rachel, would you say that you're always advocating for yourself and others? I would say I do a pretty darn good job of advocating for myself and others. Something that I have come to terms with is if I'm not able to talk about my disability, how am I supposed to help others advocate for, for, for themselves if I can't even do it for myself? This is a lesson I learned actually back in 2019 at EY, uh, having to present a, a question to our, our CEO. And I did not realize that my friends were in the crowd mortified they came up to me and they were so open saying Rachel I never knew this about you my niece actually has ADD or actually I myself like I have eight eight ADD um, and it just really hit me that my friends who you know didn't know this part about me are now able to talk to me and I could potentially help them in more ways than just being a, being a friend. And Vanessa, do you have um, friends that have no, no idea that you have a disability or maybe didn't before? Hmm. I, I think maybe when I was younger, I wasn't as open about it, but I would say now they, they pretty much all know. Um, yeah, I can't think of any of my friends that don't know now, but I mean, like, that's what makes them really true friends is like, they just, they just like you for you. And I don't really feel any different. I'm just, I'm just me. I'm, you know, I, I like that I can just be myself around them. And I'm not just, I'm not like, this is my like friend who's autistic. Like, I'm just, I'm just me. I'm just Vanessa. And so, but yeah, that's what, that's what makes somebody a friend. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Lori, do you have any comments or questions you want to ask before I go to the next slide? That's kind of you to ask, uh, Catherine. I, I keep putting myself on, on mute and, and stumbling. Um, I, I just loved everybody's responses. Um, uh, thank you. No, I have nothing to add. Back to you, Catherine. <laughs> I love these stories. So you touched on it. I think Susan started out with, uh, you know, I was advocating for uh, in, a, in a situation of race or gender or disability. So are women with disabilities viewed differently than women without disabilities? And what do you think we can do to make that change?
are you treated differently? Are you, I hope not. It sounds like to me in your careers and you're starting out that all is, is great, but not counting yourself. Do you see that? Hey, well, uh, this is Lori. I'll pipe up now while um, all you panelists are thinking about it. Yeah, Kat Catherine's shaking her head and saying, I knew she would do that. Um, McKinsey released a really fascinating study about three years ago um, that uh, uh, measured um, perceptions of um, uh, bias um, against a variety of groups, um, including women overall and women with disabilities. And I want to point out that they found that women with disabilities felt themselves to, to be uh, more disadvantaged um, by bias and negative perceptions than almost any other group, certainly far above women overall, but also to a greater degree than um, women of color without disabilities, certainly men, et cetera. Um, some of it was, uh, was obvious to us. And some of it, that piece was really counterintuitive to me. I, I think the challenge is sometimes identifying which part of you is being marginalized. Um, for me, some of the things you're judged on in business, uh, for example, being assertive and forthright and um, acting in a way that is I'm going to say traditionally male. Um, traditionally male in the U.S. is very different than the way you're raised to behave. My mother is from Japan. We don't, we're not taught to stick out. We're taught to work as a group. Um, and women were, you know, when I started my career, uh, more so than these days, if I was in a group and I gave the answer and the answer was correct as a group, nobody would hear it until a man said it. So was that because I'm blind? Was it because I am a woman? Is it, in that case, I would guess woman, but I don't know um, for certain which reason. I just know knew that until I had an ally in the group who would say, oh yeah, when Susan suggested that earlier, um, and this was often another woman, but sometimes it was a really good boss. Um, my answers wouldn't be acknowledged. I was also taught by a woman early on not to give the answer right away, even if you knew what the answer was or what the solution could be, because it wouldn't be listened to because as a female, it wouldn't be taught, listened to the same way. I still see a little bit of that today. It's less. Um, I certainly see more allies and more people who are aware of over-talking women um, and over-talking people with disabilities, but it's still there. And I think when you combine the two uh, and you, especially if you add a person of color or a person from a different background, I mean, I look white, but my cultural background is very different. Um, there's a range of challenges. Rachel? You have some thoughts about perspectives? I do. And I've I've been lucky enough that in the environments that I've been working in so far in my career, I've had wonderful leaders and teammates who we are able to bounce ideas back and forth. There was never a power struggle in the situations I, I was in. Um, I will say. Personally, I have felt less feminine due to my disability because it affects my handwriting. I am the worst speller in the world and my handwriting looks like chicken scratch. And as a child, I felt that my handwriting really held me back. Even going into college, I never wanted people to see my handwriting. Um, 
I always have to remind myself that sometimes the brightest minds have the worst handwriting. And I'm thankful that I also have technology nowadays that lets everyone have the exact same handwriting. We all have that Times Roman numeral 12 size font. Not me. I can I need 14 or 16. Thank you very much. <laughs> Vanessa? So, yeah. So um, I think that what makes it really apparent that women with disabilities are still viewed differently is really what you see in media and what you see in the news. Um, I don't know if any of you heard the story. I think it happened maybe about a year or two ago about there was a young woman going through a sorority rush recruitment at, um, at a college and she had Down syndrome and she got rejected from all the sororities. And she was saying that she thinks that the reason that was, was just because she had Down syndrome. And I actually heard a few stories like that where um, women with various different disabilities wouldn't get into certain sororities, not because they didn't have the grades, not because they weren't like great people with great personalities, but just because they were disabled and people were being ableist. Um, and um, even, I mean, I just, I think that like, I've definitely experienced some othering in my life. Um, I do think that, um, Teenage girls, especially, and even young women as well, can be really brutal and be really mean. And, you know, I'm somebody that I think that I have fairly similar interests to what most like young women my age like. So I would, um, and, you know, I did, I did in high school as well. So, but I would try to talk to people and talk about things that they liked and that I also liked. But for some reason, they just didn't really want to be friends with me and didn't want to talk to me. And I just never really got why. But my only thing I could think of is maybe they just sensed there was something off about me. Um, so I just, and also even just, I think that the way that when women with disabilities are included in something or like the spokeswoman of an ad campaign or something like that, it's looked at as really noteworthy and it's made to be a really big deal. And it's wonderful that when companies do this and when companies do include women with disabilities as their like models or um, spokespeople or something like that. But I don't think that that should be newsworthy. I think that it should just be a normal thing. And I think the best way to change perspectives is through representation. Like um, you probably have heard people say representation matters and it's true. So the mother of the disability rights movement, Judy Human, she did a lot for women. She did a lot for the disability rights movement. She was an amazing person. For anything that you know about her, whether personally or what you've read, something that you would encourage someone else to replicate. I think her persistence was amazing. And I think that that's one of those things that you have to keep going. Um, and she never stopped. She, you know, no was not, you know, you pretty learn, you learn pretty early on with Judy that no was not going to be an answer, not the final answer anyway, <laughs> um, because she would push and push and push. And sometimes make people uncomfortable, and and that was okay because it made them ready to change. And so I think that persistence is something that, whether you have a disability or not, is critical to success. Anyone else? This is Rachel. I actually would like to quote Judy: "Independent living is not being thing." Is, is not doing things by yourself. It is being in control of how things are done. This quote really spoke to me because when you are able to make the decision for yourself, you're more likely to 
do more that it means more to you. So for her to be able to live the life that she did and push, I, I've been privileged enough to not have to go through what she did. I was able to take for granted that I had special education, that I already had the groundwork laid out for me to be able to be where I am today. So, um, yeah, this is Vanessa. What I really took away from Judy and her story is that she really knew herself well and she knew what she was capable of and she wouldn't let anyone tell her what you, what she could and could not do. And I think that that's really important to have that confidence in yourself because only you know what you're capable of. And when, um, when they told her that she couldn't be a teacher because she wouldn't be able to get her students out of the building fast enough, like she knew that wasn't true. Like she said that she could probably get out of the building faster when there's a fire because of her electric wheelchair than somebody who's just on foot. Um, and so she just, she just didn't give up and she was able to um, keep her confidence in herself and keep and um, keep persisting and showing people like everything that she could do. And then I, then eventually she was able to open some doors that were closed. And I like that she just, kept knocking on the doors until they opened. And I think that that's super inspiring and it's definitely something that I hope to replicate in my life. Can I add a couple things about um, Judy that I think people don't know? Please. Um, one is that Judy always surrounded herself by powerful people. Not like, I'm not talking politicians or presidents, which she also knew but people who were supportive, people who are good people, people who are strong, people you could cry to, and more than that, people you could laugh with. And the other thing is she had a lot of joy in her life. It wasn't, you know, yes, she fought for many things. Yes, things were unfair. Yes, things were a real challenge and she had to, you know, sometimes be louder or harsher than maybe she'd want to be. But she also found a lot of joy and a lot of friendship and camaraderie in the disability community and in the allies uh, around. So that joy is also important. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, can I add one more thing? Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to look at the clock right now because I had so many problems. So let's keep going until we want to stop. Um, this is Lori. I, I want to, uh, this relates to Judy and, and really all of you. Um, and it's about confidence. Um, Judy often credits the enormous confidence she had from an early age to her mother, who, um, you know, was a Holocaust survivor and had every reason in life to be timid and afraid, but, um, was not and stood up, believed in her daughter and stood up for, for her from the start and was a role model in that way for Judy. And the reason I'm pointing this out is it connects with something that Rachel said, which is, um, and, and actually you just said, Susan too, which is that we can all give confidence to one another um, by supporting one another in community uh, by looking to uh, help one another grow, develop, become visible, advance, we can all build one another's confidence because let's face it, we're not all lucky enough to have terrific parents um, like Judy did. So to some degree, we, we need to choose our families. And we need to choose those wisely, as as you just said, Susan. 
Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And for those of you who need to hop off, I'll just mention that the system, system is recording. And of course, we'll send the recording out so that you, if you ha can't stay, I understand. Uh, but we look forward to continuing this conversation. So let's go ahead to roadblocks. And we've kind of talked about this. I've heard, uh, really, Susan has shared a lot of things, and all of you have. But what kind of roadblock have you had in your career as a woman? What kind of roadblock as a woman with a disability? And what about a person with an apparent or non-apparent disability? Does that make a difference? And you don't have to answer those in any order, just to just have the conversation of what, what were they and what did you do? This and as right. you said, you can never tell what it is exactly, whether it's because I'm a female or because I have a disability or because I'm young or because I'm old or all of those things. You can never really tell. But Rachel, I'm sorry, I didn't need to walk, talk over you. Oh, no worries. Um, this is Rachel. As I mentioned earlier, I've been lucky that I've had the groundwork laid out for me that I haven't had as many roadblocks as Susan or, or Judy had um, in the years before before me, not, not trying to say anything. Um, but um, for the roadblocks I have had, I would say professional exams are very much not meant for individuals that have visible or non-visible disabilities. Uh, as an accounting major, I originally went for the certified public accountant, the CPA. And it's four exams that you have to take and pass within 18 months of each other. And it is very hard. It is, if you know anybody who's a CPA in your life, give them a pat on the back. Um, I failed. <laughs> And it was heartbreaking. I tried doing it the same way as everybody else. And you go into these facilities with everybody on these computers. People are walking in and out. You're hearing little sounds. You're trying to focus. I am a audible learn, aud audible learner. So for me, reading out loud is the best way. And I, I couldn't do it. So a little bit later, a little career change later, I went to sit for the Certified Information Systems Auditor, the CISA exam. And I, this time, I listened to myself and what I needed and got accommodations. And I was able to have a room to myself to be able to read out loud. And I was able to pass on the first try. And it made me so happy to know that I listened to myself. I felt comfortable in myself to be able to ask for what I needed. That's that's a true life lesson right there. To be be your own self. Comments, Susan? I, I think technology has been an incredible enabler and it has also been an incredible barrier. Um, I think we're getting to the point where we're doing more and more with technology and introducing it in ways that are accessible for blind people or deaf people, but there's a lot of catch up. And so one of the roadblocks that I deal with and a lot of people who use screen readers or who use interpreters or who need accommodations or need to be able to make sure something doesn't time out is we have this additional job. So not only are we a spouse and a parent and a worker, but then we have to advocate in our work and sometimes in our home, you know, or social, you know, like schools and things that we're dealing with to just get basic access. So I think one of the barriers that's difficult is, is not only having our all, you know, more than full-time jobs, as, as women and as people with disabilities who are workers, but also having to be an advocate and having to use that additional time when it's time that other people need, never need to do. So, you know, if I have an eight hour day, which very few of us actually only have an eight hour day, um, I might have to spend another two hours because somebody didn't put their documents in an accessible way or I've had to find a workaround um, because uh, the system wasn't set up for someone who couldn't see. And so I think it's an ongoing thing and there's a, a, an element of fatigue that can go with that. 
Um, and that's where the support becomes so important. Well, what I found the most difficult is as someone who has a non-apparent disability, like it's something that's hidden, is I think even when you try to explain what your needs are and what you might need a little extra help with, people will still be dismissive even when you tell them because they just, they just, you know, because they can't see it and because your disability isn't apparent to them, they just can't really wrap their head around that you might need some extra support. And a lot of people just, um, I've, I've run into a lot of people that were not very accommodating and just kind of treated me like I was being a burden if I asked for help. So um, I have found that challenging. Also, um, I do think that that kind of applies to maybe being a woman as well, because as we know, um, women are dismissed a lot um, when, uh, when they say what their um, needs are, especially in something like a medical community. Like, I mean, we've all heard about like women trying to advocate to doctors and doctors not believing them. Um, and that applies to other things as well. So I think that, um, I mean, I don't know if um, it would, uh, yeah, I don't know if I would be less dismissed if I was a man with a disability instead, but um, I think that maybe being a woman uh, it definitely doesn't help things as far as um, people taking you seriously. Um, and, um, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's it for me. That's all I had to say. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. So let's move to the next question that really some of these you've answered in different ways, but how do you manage your disabilities on a day-to-day -day basis to be successful? Um, other than having to work more, that's not a good thing. Anyone who would like to answer? Uh well, for me, I think um, it's, a, it's a newer thing I'm doing, but one thing that Broad Futures has really taught me is about um, wellness and um, taking care of your mind and giving yourself breaks when you need to. Like we have done a lot of practice of yoga and acupressure and mindfulness and all those techniques, I think really help me during the day. Like there's some really easy ones that you're able to just do at your desk. Um, or just if you're able to like, just step aside and do it, um, that you can really do from anywhere. So I like that I have those techniques now. And I think that that can really help because, um, not only can I get burnt out and overwhelmed easily because of my disability, but also, um, I have an anxiety disorder. So that makes things challenging for me as well. But all my wellness strategies and practices that I was taught at Broad Futures have been great to manage all of those. And I think anybody could benefit from that. Thanks, Vanessa. And one of the things we're doing also at at t is focus a lot on wellness, including um, programs that are put together by our ability, which is our disability employee, employee group. And so I, I agree with the wellness. I should probably go to Broad Futures and, and do more of it. But um, I think that that's, there's a lot of that, a lot of finding joy, things that make you happier and refresh you because, you know, life can be tough. And that's the reality. And the more you can put into yourself, the stronger and happier you can be, the easier it is to deal with the very real challenges. This is Rachel. One thing I learned and that I hope everyone takes, takes away is that when you understand yourself and you understand your strengths and your skills, what you originally thought was your way of keeping up with your disability is actually what sets you apart when you get into the professional world. I had to learn how to study, spend time reading through the books, 
taking extra notes, asking for outlines so that I can be successful in school that led me to being a great coworker and leader in my job because I'm able to see a little bit further ahead because I know I have to plan further ahead to make sure I stay successful. Thank you. Um, I think it's almost 5.15. Um, if you all won't mind staying with me, I wanted to ask about accommodations next or a workplace adjustments. Um, do you all need an accommodation at work or do you accommodate yourself? And what was it like when you had to ask for an accommodation that you might be able to tell someone else? Because of the work that we've done with young people tell us that they don't know what they don't know. And most people in the research I've read, most people with a disability will not uh, disclose that they have a disability in a job interview unless they absolutely need some kind of an accommodation. But what has been your experiences around requesting an accommodation? Uh, well, Catherine, I just want to say that I um, can really relate to what you said about not knowing what I don't know. And then also um, being hesitant to request an accommodation unless I really needed it. Like that's that's something I really relate to. So I'm glad you brought that up. But um, I think that because of broad features, I've really been learning how to request accommodations. And um, I've really been able to practice that and realize that um, it can be a really great thing to ask for. And it, you know, definitely it can be, it can, it's anxiety producing to do it. Like, I'm not going to lie and say that it's a walk in the park, but, um, but I, it's, it's definitely worth it. If it's something that's going to help you to perform your best, because just from a, from a work perspective, like that's, that's, really what everyone wants that's what everyone who's managing you like wants is they want you to be able to be the best worker and do the best performance so uh if you need something to do that then you know definitely ask for it um i for me what i think helps the accommodation that helps me to be the most successful at my internship right now is asking for written out lists of what i'm asked to do because if i'm just uh, if it's just spoken out loud to me, it's just going to go in one ear and out the other. Um, so I, I love just having like a list to refer to. And also even just, it gives you a sense of accomplishment too, when you're able to check something off. So that's just kind of an added bonus, but, um, you know, I've, um, I found that when I was able to ask for that, um, my supervisor was happy to provide it. And, um, I, you know, I think that if you just go in and you're able to confidently speak about what you need and why you need it and say it with confidence, then um, I think generally people will um, be happy to do it. Well, people are hired to be successful. So we want yeah. to, that's, that's the whole point. We don't yes. hire people to fail. It's too mm -hmm. much. Involved. I think for me, switching from the idea of an accommodation to a productivity tool mm -hmm. really made a difference because what I need is to be as productive as possible mm -hmm. and to be able to interact and do my job as well as I can. And, you know, just as someone who is sighted needs a screen, they would never say, I need an accommodation. I need a screen on my computer. Right. And so what is the difference between that and a screen reader? Uh, only that the vision thing was that first. That was, that was it. Um, and so I think going in with confidence and knowing what you need. And I think there's a few different ways to find that. One is through, you know, a functional assessment. So if it's a, a learning disability, if it's a thing with executive function, if it's uh, a visual loss even, you know, you can get some information about some of the tools that work. Once you have that, that identification or diagnosis, that's the first step. Uh, and working with specialists and more than that, working with people who are in similar fields, who can tell you what they do and what works for them. You know, I do list as well. 
I do lists because, you know, I'm getting older. My memory's not as great. Used to be able to hold everything in my head. Can't do anymore. Is that any different than what you're doing because of a, a disability? I don't, I don't think so. It's just our way of being more productive. The difference is the stigma that we've had and the ableism we've all grown up with that says it's asking for a favor or something special and it's not. It's asking for the tools you need. And so I've been fortunate the people that I work with and I've been doing this long enough, I just say, I need this. They say yes. Um, but I also have a different experience because most of my disabilities are, are visible. So you can tell I can't say I come in with a cane. When it comes to things like fatigue or things that are related to MS or you know post-cancer treatment, I've had to use that same mindset in going in and saying, you know, if I can break my day up, take half an hour nap, I can go a lot longer and be more productive. And you know what? That's fine because I'm not covering a front desk at that time. You know, it's not an essential part of my job to be having exactly the same hours someone else has. Rachel? I don't actually specifically have accommodations. I, technology has very much helped me out with that. Mm -hmm. uh, being an auditor, actually, funny enough, helps me out as we have outlines when we go into our meetings to what questions we're going to ask. So I know how to stay up. Um, I will say advocating and being open about my disability has allowed others to feel comfortable in talking to me about it and disclosing. Um, I'm one of those individuals that did not disclose when I got hired. It took some time to be able to sit here today and talk to you all about this. Um, knowing accommodations, it sounds too formal. You know, I think that's something that we've all been talking about. Accommodations are too formal, feels like a special favor. It's just, this is how I am. This is, I work better if I'm not sitting in a conference room with everybody typing away on their laptops. I need to have my own little desk so I'm not as distracted. Or I need that break. You know, my, my life is crazy. I have to take a 30 minute break, an hour lunch. Allowing people to be who they are instead of calling it an accommodation or a special request goes a lot longer. So we remember Kathy Martinez, who always used, not we remember that she's passed away, she's not, uh, but we remember for what she's always said is it's a productivity tool. And that's really, and but we know we have to use the word accommodations. Well, we legally. don't use the word, but legally, you know, that's what they're going to provide. But all right. So um, if I still have you around, let's talk about mentoring. What's the value of it? Do you have a mentor? Are you a mentor? Um, I think, Vanessa, you said you have someone that is your mentor. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works for you? Yes. Yeah, so Broad Futures, what's so nice is um, every everybody in the program gets a mentor and every, um, every week I meet with my mentor twice a week um, to check in about what my, what my goals were, were in the program and then just general check in about how everything's going and if there's any challenges I'm facing, anything causing stress or confusion. So I like that there's somebody I'm able to talk to about that um, that I know is just like, um, a safe person to talk about it with. And I know that I can just say whatever's on my mind. And then uh, I'm able to, along with my mentor, just sort out anything that I'm going through. And then I'm able to um, take a, um, have sort of a game plan and then go back into my job with strategies um, to, tackle what, what whatever challenge I'm tackling and then also weekly I'm able to meet with my mentor and um, just talk about my overall week and they're all um, also what the mentors do in broad futures is they talk to 
our supervisors. So we're able to kind of have that person in between. Um, so um, just like as an extra support for supervisors and then also, um, and then also the interns in the program. So I definitely really appreciate that part of Broad Futures um, because I, just, I feel extra supported for sure. Sorry, what was the question? Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. Would you want to be a mentor at some point in your career? I really would. Um, I think that I just really enjoy encouraging and supporting people. And I think that it's something that I could do well once I get my career a little bit more off the ground. So hopefully I'll do that one day. Good for you. Rachel, Susan, what about mentoring? What does that mean to you? I actually still have mentors. I don't necessarily call them that, but it, I have my go-to people who have expertise in certain parts of the business or on specific topics that I will go to and say, explain this part of, of AI or help me understand the ergonomics issue here or you know just the field because you you only have one life one area of expertise it's really wonderful i work with brilliant people i can just tap and ask any question and not worry how stupid it sounds because they're vested in my learning more and doing my job better and then there are also people that i go to for career advice um, that has been less effective um, and one of the things that, that there's a shift toward instead of having a mentor, but having someone who works as a sponsor, mm -hmm. who's invested in your actual career growth. Right. And so um, that's one area that's been um, pushed. They act as an advocate because the reality is as a woman, a woman with a disability, a person of color, you're often not in the same social circles. And we know in business, people tend to hire people who are like them or that they know. And so having someone who's in those circles, who can open doors, who can say to you, yes, this is great, but you also need to know X, Y, Z. Maybe you need to go for an MBA or maybe it's don't go for an MBA because you'll be too over, you know, you'll be overqualified or, you know, just to provide advice. And then when I mentor someone, I usually gain as much, maybe more than they do. You know, I've learned a lot more about social media than I would have otherwise, um, because I just wasn't raised in that time period. Um, and, you know, changes in culture. We all win. Rachel? This is Rachel uh, talking about, um, people hiring people that are close to them or teaming up with them at ey we do have a saying called team plus one always bring in somebody new um, so you don't get stuck in that to where you're always calling on the same people um, i have been a mentor and a mentee in the past i'm currently going through another kind of career change within ey changing um from an auditor to more of a consultant so um when speaking to my men mentors, the, the, the confidence that they give me to be able to make decisions is un unquestionable. I, I, can't, I can't thank them enough. And, you know, Lori Golden, who's on the call, love you. <laughs> uh, she has been there for me many a times personally when I've had questions and needed some almost like motherly advice. Not from my actual mother. <laughs> <laughs> Think of it as more sisterly advice. I would be honored, Rachel. <laughs> well, Rachel, I must tell you that um, Lori is one of my mentors. I always call her when I'm stuck at something. So, and I think she Everybody does. Everybody does. I, yeah, I mean, and I think that's what we talked about at Judy Human. I remember her her laughter really more than anything. Um, the last time I saw her was at the NOD conference and she's just 
there's no other Judy. She just was the most amazing woman. But I think when we've heard, and I'm going to um, switch to this next slide, because those of you who don't know about Broad Features, that is the link. It's broadfeatures.org. Um, also, we talked about knowing in a comment what your, your productivity tool might be needed, uh, the Office of Disability Employment Policy, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, um, has technical assistance centers, and one of them is the Job Accommodation Network, a wonderful resource. If you don't know, that's where to find out what you should know. Uh, the ADA Information ADA Center is also great, and Ask Earn, the Employer Assistance for Resource Network on Disability Inclusion. And of course, please um, go to read our article on Women's History Month, not, not an article, but many history, many articles about amazing women with disabilities is in that newsletter for March. Uh, and also ask you to please um, visit our website. We have a program next week that's hybrid, will be in person at General Dynamics Mission Systems. And thank you, Andrea Hall, for hosting us again for federal updates. So we have OFCCP, EEOC, and of course, the all famous um, ODEP folks from the Assistant uh, Secretary Taryn to our favorite uh, Deputy Jennifer Sheehy and Lou Orslein, who came from the Job Accommodation Network. So if you want to register, uh, please go to our website and do that. I would love for you all to have a few minutes of just closing remarks, but I wanted to tie this in to say what I've heard today. And Lori, I know that you will have some something to add to this, but when I think about mentoring, I really think about who's in my network and the networking is the most important thing I think that gives me joy to know who and where and how um, and how to ask. Having confidence in yourself that actually came clear through today, knowing yourself, taking care of yourself and being committed to the quest. That is a lovely, lovely way to end this wonderful um, event today. So um, I'll go in order of top to bottom on my screen, not in any other order, but Vanessa, do you have anything you'd like to close us out with? And if you don't, that's fine. That, hmm, I've got to think about that for a minute. Okay. Uh, I would say that um, I find it really important to, um, like like you said, not only just find your chosen family, but I think find members of your chosen family that um, have been through what you've been through. I really find value in talking to other women with disabilities, other autistic women um, who have um, maybe, um, who are a little older than me, who have had more life experience than me and they're able to um, guide me and advise me. So I just, I really appreciate that. I like to be a sponge and soak up all the knowledge that I can. And I think that everyone should do that too. I think that um, the more support that you can get, the better. So um, reach out and make friends and uh, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. And I just wanted to also say thank you. Um, I've never been on a panel before, but I'm glad that I was asked to do it. And I really enjoyed my time here. So thank you, everybody. Vanessa, it's been great to have you. And I hope you'll consider coming back. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. Yeah. Rachel, anything to close us out? I would say feeling comfortable with yourself and understanding yourself will change your life. Once you're able to do that, the world is at your door. Beautiful. Susan. I would say don't assume that everybody else has the answers. They have all the answers and you don't, no one has the answers. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask for support and to give support and to make mistakes because nobody really knows everything. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Lori Golden, who I can't see. And also thank you very much to IELO, TCS Interpreting. Um, and I appreciate all of your patience with my technical talents. I obviously need some more mentoring in that, that capacity. But thank you all so much. And I will send you the recording as soon as we have it cleaned up. You all take thank care. You.
Thank you. Great rest of the month. You too. Take care. All right. And hope to meet you all in person too. We'll come to the conference, Disability and Conference. So we'll do that. I'll do my best. <laughs> all right. Okay. Bye bye, guys. Bye bye. Thank you.